Oral. Oral questions the Honorable Opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, today the U.S. Vice President is here to thank the Prime Minister for giving up concession <laughs> after concession <laughs> after concession in the renegotiation of NAFTA. He basically gave Trump absolutely everything totally. he wanted. The Prime Minister made major concessions on dairy, on pharmaceuticals, on automobiles. He failed to stand up for Canada. Why did the Liberals capitulate to the U.S. on every single one of their trade demands? The Honourable Minister of Transport. We should drop our demands and rush into a bad deal and capitulate. Canadians can be glad that we did not follow their lead and stood firm for a good deal. If we had followed their advice, we wouldn't have a Chapter 19, something that they would have completely dismantled supply management. We would have had to have devastating effects on our auto sector, and within five years, we would have had a sunsetting of the deal. We stood up for Canadians. We got a great deal, Mr. Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Well, I'll tell you who does think it's a great deal, and that's Donald Trump. He's yeah, very happy. Yeah, right. You know, the Prime Minister said he wouldn't give in to steel or aluminum quotas, but guess what? He did. The so-called meaningful surge clause means that Trump gets to decide how much Canadian steel or aluminum is too much. And if Canadians suffer or jobs are lost, oh well, too bad, because guess what? The Liberals signed away our ability to retaliate. There was one, This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to get this right, and they blew it. Mr. Speaker, why won't the Prime Minister admit he failed Canadians again? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservatives, we know how important it is to stand up for Canadians. It was our government that defended the Canadian steel and aluminum industry. It is our government that put in place $16.6 billion in countermeasures, the most drastic trade action since the Second World War. The Conservatives wanted us to stop arguing with the United States and not have any counter tariffs. We stood up for Canadian steelworkers and the aluminum industry, and guess what? We won! Opposition House Leader. Well, Order. One third place, I guess, and maybe the Liberals will think that that's a win. The Prime Minister didn't stand up for Canadian jobs. He stood up for American jobs. The Prime Minister did not stand up for steel and aluminum industry. He took away our right to retaliate. The Prime Minister didn't get one concession from Donald Trump. He gave the Americans absolutely everything they wanted. Does the Prime Minister realize, and this is serious, Mr. Speaker, Canadian jobs and Canadian are going to suffer again because of this Prime Minister's failure. Does he realize what he has done? This once-in-a-generation opportunity, he blew it. Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, should I remind the Conservatives that in the last three and a half years, we have created one million jobs. We will sit, we will compare our record in three and a half years to everything the Harper government did during the last 10 years. The new DAFTA deal preserves our vital access to the U.S. market. And do you know how much that is, Mr. Speaker? It's $2 billion every single day. This is the most important trade deal in the world, and we got it right. The honourable member for Abbotsford has helpfully uh, reminded me that one member should be speaking at a time and not others joining in. And of course, that applies, as he knows, to all of us, that one member should speak at a time and not be interrupted also. The honourable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, never before in Canadian history has Canada suffered such setbacks in international trade. 
The Prime Minister promised us NAFTA 2.0. Instead, we got NAFTA 0.5. Never before has Canada caved in so much on trade, in the auto sector, on prescription drugs, in agriculture. And this Prime Minister says this is a gain for Canada, a win? No, it isn't. Mr. Trump and Mr. Pence are very happy with this deal, and we know why. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives repeatedly said we should abandon our claims and enter into a bad deal and basically capitulate. Canadians can be happy that we did not follow their example. If we had taken their advice, we would have a deal without a Chapter 19, with completely dismantled supply management, with demands that would have destroyed our auto sector, and there would have been a sunset clause that would have discouraged investment in Canada. Thank goodness we didn't listen to them. The Louis the Honourable Member for Louis saint -Laurent. Mr. Speaker, once again, the CRA is entering into secret deals with big financiers. Despite what the Revenue Minister says, the CBC has revealed that KPMG managed to get a secret deal with CRA. How can the Revenue Minister accept this situation? And I would invite her not to say that the noose is tightening, because, in fact, it's, if it's tightening around anyone's necks, it's the Liberals. The Honourable Minister. Our government undertook to crack down on tax evaders. We have an independent process within the agency for dealing with these uh, tax cheats and protect the integrity of our tax system. In some circumstances, agreements may be appropriate, but I'm concerned about a lack of transparency, and that's why I've instructed the agency to review its processes to increase transparency when uh, agreements or settlements are reached. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinonge Mr. Speaker, workers are not happy with the Liberal government's rush to ratify the new NAFTA. This trade deal is bad for our farmers, consumers, workers, and the environment. The consequences could be disastrous. Disastrous, Mr. Speaker, can the Liberals show some common sense and improve this deal instead of caving in to pressure from Donald Trump, Donald Minister of Transport? Mr. Speaker, what the NDP should understand is that reopening this deal would be reopening, would be opening Pandora's box. We're protecting $2 billion worth of daily trade. The NDP is at best naive and at worst playing political games by suggesting that Canadians would benefit from reopening the deal. If the NDP has the courage, why don't they admit that they're completely against the NAFTA trade deal? The Honourable Member for berthier masquinonge Mr. Speaker, the U.S. Vice President is here today to discuss the terms of ratification of the new NAFTA with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister wants to ratify the deal quickly without debate. It's shameful, almost as shameful as Mike Pence's position on a woman's right to choose. Unlike a trade deal, a woman's right to choose is non-negotiable. But it's not enough to just raise the issue with the Vice President. Will the Prime Minister commit to providing safe and accessible health care services to all women all across Canada? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, our government will always support women's right to choose. All Canadian women deserve safe access to abortion services, and that is why we have supported the increase of services and uh, services to women all across the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Why today, and U.S. congressional members are paying attention and asking why liberals are rushing the new NAFTA. Yeah. Congresswoman Delorio said this liberal government is acting prematurely, and the quick approval of this deal is actually.
actually working against their efforts yeah. in protecting labor, the environment, yeah. and ensuring people's access to affordable medication. You know, the progressive things that Liberals pretend to care about. A better deal is possible, but instead this government is working against it by ramming through as is. Why is this Prime Minister helping Donald Trump? The Honourable Minister of Transport. The NDP should realize that reopening this deal would be like reopening Pandora's yes. box. This is the fruit of a whole year's effort by three countries to come up with a good deal. Either the NDP is naive in thinking by reopening that we're going to get a better deal, or they're playing political games. My guess is that the NDP should stand up and have the courage to say they are squarely against the NAFTA deal. Right. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals should stop fear-mongering about Pandora's box. This has happened in the U.S. twice, and it's been around only specific issues. You don't have the courage to fix the deal through you, Mr. Speaker. And Canadians know that this NAFTA will hurt our dairy industry, and no matter what the Liberals said, they didn't protect them, and the impacts will be felt by farmers, processors, and workers in the whole dairy supply chain. The mystery compensation package that is yet to materialize won't include workers who drive trucks and work in processing plants. Why do Liberals want working people to pay the price for their unwillingness to get a better deal? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Speaker, Canadians saw how hard it was to negotiate yes. this new agreement and achieve the lifting of tariffs. This was a task that all of our country was involved in. During that time, many Canadian families had real worries about whether they would lose their job. Right. Canada did its job. We have a new NAFTA deal, which is a win-win-win outcome. We have a full lift of the tariffs. It is astonishingly irresponsible that the NDP seems prepared to plunge our country into a new negotiation and period of uncertainty. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United Steelworkers warned the Liberals not to bask in the glory of their agreement to end the American steel and aluminum tariffs, which leaves Canadian businesses and workers at risk because the Liberals agreed with the Trump administration that tariffs can simply be slapped back on if the U.S. imports begin to surge. The Minister refuses to say exactly what would constitute a surge. With the livelihood of Canadian workers hanging in the balance, she better know what it means. Mr. Speaker, workers and businesses need to know, they need certainty. What constitutes a surge? The Honourable Economic Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the U.S. When the United States government imposed tariffs, we stood up for the Canadian economy. We stood up for steel and aluminum workers. We stood up for their families. We immediately retaliated dollar for dollar with Canada's strongest trade action since World War II. And despite calls by Doug Ford, by the Conservative leader, to back down, we stood firm. We have the tariffs lifted. We have a good deal. And we are now able to ratify and continue this process. Hello. Order. The Honourable Member for Shakurmi Lafleur, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister volunteered to renegotiate NAFTA and promised to get a better deal. But Canada made one concession after the other and gained nothing in exchange. He even inked the deal without first ensuring the tariffs were lifted on steel and aluminum. Now we learn the new deal contains a hidden quota that will be, Canada will be subjected to. Why did he sign such a bad deal for our workers? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservatives, we know how important it is to protect Canadian workers. The U.S. tariffs were lifted because we imposed significant retaliatory measures. In November, the member for Durham called our countervailing measures stupid and said they should be scrapped. If we had listened to the Conservatives, there would still be tariffs on Canadian steel. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Lafiol. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister's priority truly is Canadians, 
I'd like to know whether he asked the U.S. Vice President for help in connection with Mr. André Gauthier, a Canadian citizen from chicoutimi le fjord who is currently detained in the United Arab Emirates, a country with a dismal human rights record. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we are aware of this situation. Our government is working on this matter and has been for some time. The minister has been in direct contact with the family. The issue has been raised with the authorities and with the United Arab Emirates. We're following and monitoring the situation closely and will continue to do so. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister promised a plan to help the workers at Oshawa's General Motor plant, and he failed to do so. The Prime Minister failed to come to Oshawa to meet with workers to justify this mistake. And it took over two weeks for the Prime Minister to even pick up the phone to call the Mayor of Oshawa. And now, in the Prime Minister's new NAFTA agreement, automakers, including General Motors in Oshawa, are now limited in how many cars they can export to the United States. Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister explain why he didn't raise the issue of quotas on automobiles with the United States Vice President? Honourable Minister of Innovation. Speaker, one of the key sectors to benefit from the new NAFTA was the automotive sector. We shielded this sector, Mr. Speaker, so we can continue to see production for years to come. And with regards to GM, with regards to Oshawa, our government supported the workers every single day. And we were there when the solution was proposed as well, Mr. Speaker. And over the last few years, we've seen $6 billion invested in the automotive sector. And if you want to compare our track record, 11,000 new jobs created in the automotive sector versus 20,000 jobs lost under the Conservatives before the recession even hit. The Honourable Member for Durham. Order. Mr. Speaker, it's quite ironic the Liberals feel NAFTA 0.5 is a win when there was no gains and only losses sector by sector. But Canadians should be very troubled by the fact that the bill has a provision that allows the Prime Minister and Cabinet to change the deal after we voted on it. So if this is such a good deal, why do they have a provision that says it will change? Do they know that they will accept whatever Donald Trump gives them? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We stood firm for a good deal, and we got a good deal. The new NAFTA preserves our vital access to U.S. market and safeguards $2 billion a day in cross-border trade between our countries. The International Trade Commission reported that as a result of this deal, Canadian exports to the United States will increase by almost $20 billion, as will those from the uh, U.S. to Canada. This is a good deal for Canadians. We will take every step we need to take very carefully, making sure that Canadians are protected Canadian workers are protected and our economy continues to flourish. Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, in his meeting with the U.S. Vice President, the Prime Minister did not raise Canada's Arctic sovereignty, despite the fact two weeks ago Secretary of State Pompeo questioned our sovereignty in the Arctic. At a time where Russia and China are showing ambitions there, this Prime Minister is failing our North, Mr. Speaker. Now, we know they signed away our sovereignty in the trade deal, why aren't they standing up for it in our Arctic? <laughs> the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Canada's Arctic sovereignty is long-standing and it's well established. As a person who lived in the subarctic and has experienced Arctic weather, Arctic concerns, Arctic expenses, let me tell you, this government stands with the people of the Arctic and will always stand for Canadian Arctic sovereignty. We will continue to work with international partners. We will declare sovereignty and take every opportunity to ensure that Canada's interests and the interests of Canadians are maintained. Oh. Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. The people of Grassy Narrows believe this prime minister when he made a solemn promise to build a mercury treatment center. He even gave them a timeline and then nothing happened. I guess we should have known the punchline was coming when the prime minister made a joke about them for his rich donor friends. So the punchline came yesterday, an empty agreement. No wonder Grassy Narrows refused to sign that bogus agreement. You know, politics is full of broken promises, but this one? How does the prime minister justify such deplorable treatment to the people of Grassy Narrows? Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. 
Mr. Speaker, building a health facility in Grassy Narrows is an absolute priority. That's why the minister went yesterday to meet with the chief and council in the community yesterday. Progress is being made, and we are committed to a comprehensive solution that meets the needs of all of the community. The people of Grassy Narrows have suffered for over 50 years. We will find a path forward on a plan that meets the needs of the community now and in the long term. Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Oh God, that's their idea of a priority. No money for Grassy Narrows, but hey, lots of money for the billionaire Irvings. Speaking of which, the media asked this government if they gave $40 million to the Irvings to make French fries in Lethbridge as part of an Arctic shipbuilding contract. What did the Liberals do? They tipped off the Irvings, who then threatened the Globe and Mail with a lawsuit. So think about that. A government snitch line for billionaires to target journalists over the spending of taxpayers' money. What is this Prime Minister trying to do? Turn Canada into some kind of two-bit potato republic for his friends? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we have clear obligations to verify information that is commercially sensitive. We must receive consent from the contractor and my team and officials followed all the appropriate steps respecting privacy. And with regards to the reporter, he received the information that he requested. Député de the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, we learned today that the Liberals did public opinion polling on deferred prosecution agreements months before hiding DPAs in the 2018 omnibus bill. Canadians from coast to coast apparently see these agreements as pre preferential treatment for criminal and corrupt CEOs looking to avoid jail time. So the Liberals didn't have public opinion on their side. Is that why the Finance Minister buried DPAs deep within his bill at the last minute? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Justice Minister. The issue of deferred prosecution agreement. It was announced to Canadians through a gazetting process. Two, that consultations took place around the country. Three, that it appeared and was vetted at the Finance Committee of the House of Commons. It was also vetted by a Senate Standing Committee. Exactly. These agreements exist in, among five members of the G7, Japan, Britain, uh, Ca the United States, Canada and France. They are important measures that ensure accountability at the corporate level and ensuring that employees are rendered harmless. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. What we've seen is that uh, Canadians were not in support of this idea of protecting corrupt criminals. The former Attorney General knew that sticking DPAs in the ominous bill at the last minute was just a hidden way of protecting the Liberals' corrupt cronies at SNC-Lavalin. We know about the Prime Minister's sustained campaign of pressure and political interference against her for months and months. Why is the Prime Minister hiding this? The Honourable, I would encourage members to, uh, the member to be careful about the words he chooses. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the policy at issue, it's very important to tell the to underscore the truth in this matter for the sake of Canadians watching. The first thing is one. Secondly, you must pay a penalty. Two. Thirdly, you must pay victim restitution. Three. Fourthly, you must cooperate with ongoing investigations. These agreements are not about get out of jail free cards. They're about holding corporate directors responsible for corporate wrongdoing. We agree with the member opposite that those people need to be held accountable, and they are. Bravo. Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, actually, based on those very criteria that the member just listed, SNC Lavalin does not qualify for a deferred prosecution agreement. That's just not my opinion. That's the opinion of the top prosecutor, the former attorney general, and now, most recently, a Quebec judge. We already know Canadians don't support special deals for accused corporate criminals. Will the government confirm that no politician will overturn the justice system and give a special deal to SNC Lavalin. Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. 
Mr. Speaker, we're well aware of the decision that was rendered yesterday in a matter that is currently before the court. That was a preliminary inquiry determining about an, a, about an evidentiary threshold in an ongoing criminal matter. It would be entirely inappropriate for me as Parliamentary Secretary, or indeed for any member of Parliament, to comment on an ongoing criminal matter. So I'll refrain from doing so. Honourable Member Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, this is new. Now, all of a sudden, they don't think politicians should be involved in the justice system. What a strange turn of events, because the top prosecutor, the former Attorney General, a Quebec judge, and Canadians writ large all believe corporate, accused corporate criminals like SNC-Lavalin should face the music in a trial. Unfortunately, the matter is not closed. The government still gives itself the power to interfere. Will they confirm that no politician on that side will interfere to cancel the trial into SNC Lavalin? Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate that member has been a member of this House longer than I have, but I also appreciate that he doesn't have significant experience in legal matters. So let me just educate him about this one point. The, the, reason, why, the reason why the sub judice Convention exists is because you shouldn't have elected officials who are involved in appointing judges potentially influencing a decision made by an appointed judge. That's called inappropriate influence over the judicial decision-making process. That's why all members of Parliament are covered by the sub judice rule and why his former House leader invoked that convention 300 times in the last Parliament. Order. Mark. Order. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, we learned today that the government signed an agreement with KPMG. KPMG, rather, this is absurd and is contrary to everything that the minister had been saying for years. This is another demonstration that there are two kinds of rules: one for one for one kind of people and one for everyone else. How can the minister blame public servants for what happened? Mr. Speaker, the minister had an opportunity. Why did she let that big fish get away with no consequences, the Honourable Minister of National Revenue? Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, our government is firmly committed to fighting against tax fraudsters. And the proceedings are independent of the CRA in order to ensure the integrity of the tax system, even though I understand that regulations will be used inappropriately in some circumstances. I'm very concerned, and that's why I have told the CRA to review its processes to allow for greater transparency. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, the only thing that doesn't change is the government signing agreements with its millionaire cronies. Mr. Speaker, all over my riding, we're finding white ghost bikes. Do you know why? It's to remind people that cyclists have been killed. These are tragic and avoidable accidents. And I say they're avoidable because there are safety measures that are available. Even the department experts propose them. The minister still hasn't done anything. How many more deaths? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his commitment on this very serious issue. The vulnerability of cyclists and pedestrians is very important. We have published a series of measures that can be used at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. At the federal level, we have project, pilot projects to increase visibility for truckers and drivers of big vehicles. And as soon as we have wrapped this up, we will make, come to a decision. And I would encourage municipal, municipalities and provinces to do whatever they can. Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, my constituents in Kitchener Centre are deeply concerned about climate change. One young woman named Elizabeth Rose, age 15, wrote me a letter expressing concern that inaction on climate change will keep her from celebrating her 75th birthday. 
Our government believes that we are experiencing a national climate emergency. Unlike others in this House, we also know that a healthy economy and a healthy environment go hand in hand. Could the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change please highlight what our government is doing to transition to a clean economy so that Elizabeth will celebrate her 75th birthday? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre uh, for his question. Uh, and I want to talk directly to Elizabeth Rose. We are absolutely committed to tackling climate change right Right now, we've seen flooding in the National Capital Region in New Brunswick. We have forest fires that have started earlier out west. We need to take action. That's exactly what we're doing. We're phasing out coal, ensuring a just transition for workers and communities, making historic investments in public transportation, in clean technologies, in energy efficiency. At the same time, we've created a million jobs because I know Canadians expect us to take action on the environment and grow the economy. The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Mr. Speaker, Vice Admiral Mark Norman served this country with dignity and honour and hopes to continue to do so. But these Liberals sabotaged his career and have attempted to cover it up. Yesterday, all Liberal MPs voted to continue the cover-up and refused to release the secret memo sent by disgraced former Clerk of the Privy Council Michael Wernick regarding the Vice Admiral Mark Norman affair. What are these Liberals trying to hide? Here, here. Thank you. As my colleague knows, once again, com committees work independently from Parliament. They make their own decisions. I think it's very difficult for members of the opposition to understand because we know perfectly well they tried to control committees under the previous government. In terms of Vice Admiral Norman's matter, the prosecution service noted that no, there were no outside factors that were considered and there was no outside influence. And any accusation to the contrary is without basis and is absurd. Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals think that if they just repeat their lines loud enough, Canadians will accept all their cover-ups. Yesterday, they resumed the Mark Norman cover-up. They voted against releasing the memo sent by disgraced former Privy Council clerk Michael Warnick on the Norman affair. They, they keep on continuing the cover-up because obviously they have something to hide. Exactly. What are they hiding and when are they going to come clean with the truth? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'll have to repeat this. The service works independently from the government and any uh, statement to the contrary is absurd. Canadians can trust our system. We supported a motion that acknowledged Vice Admiral Norman's service and that apologized to him and his family. And we await the next step. There have been discussions between General Vance and Vice Admiral Norman, and undermining the credibility of the legal process in this country is absurd and without basis. Uh. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lara. Well, let's talk about the government. The Prime Minister does not want Canadians to know the whole truth about the Norman affair. Yesterday, he forced the Minister of National Defence and the entire caucus to vote against the release of a memo. In 2015, they announced an open and transparent government. In 2019, we have a government mired in scandals and secrets. If the Prime Minister has nothing to hide, why is he muzzling his minister and all those who could shed light on the truth of the Norman affair? The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, once again. In terms of Vice Admiral Norman's affair, the uh, prosecution service said that all decisions were made independently. No outside factors were considered. There was no outside influence, and there was no political influence. And, Mr. Speaker, my colleague should know that any procedures undertaken by the Public Prosecution Service or the RCMP are done independently. And if he doesn't do that, maybe he should take a quick course in law. We will respect the judicial process in this country. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. But, Mr. Order. Speaker, the government still has a responsibility to Canadians. The Prime Minister promised that he would be transparent by default and that sunshine is the best disinfectant. The political that? interference in the Admiral Norman case has been disgustingly covered up, and Canadians deserve to know the truth. Yesterday, the Liberals voted against releasing an unredacted version of the 60-page document that the disgraced former clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, sent to the Prime Minister. What is the Prime Minister? 
minister hiding? Why won't he tell Canadians the truth? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Mr. Speaker, I'll repeat it again to my colleague. She knows that committees work independently from government. Uh, she used to be with the government. She knows how our committees work under this government rather than under the Harper government. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the uh, Vice Admiral Norman matter, there were no outside factors that were considered in the decision. There was no outside influence or political influence. Mr. Speaker, we are going to respect the process. There were discussions between General Vance and Vice Admiral Norman with respect to his return to work, and we will respect that process. Honourable member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, while the Liberals announced funding to deal with the backlog at Veterans Affairs, it's clear that the system is still broken. One veteran has been waiting over a year for a decision that VAC says takes 16 weeks. He is not the only one. VAC is currently processing claims from October 2017. Can the minister explain to veterans in this House why this new investment meant to help the process happen faster, they're still waiting, in some cases, years for the help they so desperately need. Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. And I can assure her our government is committed to making sure that we deliver for veterans. Yes, we did invest $10 billion new dollars, which included $42 million to address the backlog, and hired 630 new frontline staff, because there was a major reduction in frontline staff. It's also important to realize that there's a 66 percent increase in applications at Veterans Affairs, because Veterans Affairs says yes more often. We take care of our veterans, Mr. Speaker. Order. The honourable member for Cowich and Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, climate change is having a detrimental impact on our rivers and watersheds. Water levels in the Cowichan River are already low for this time of year, and startling new projections predict the river could run dry by July. This past Saturday, I was on the river helping rescue salmon fry who were stranded in pools from the rapidly receding main river. The situation is dire, and my community is calling for leadership. When will this federal government commit to the funding necessary to raise the couch and weir to save this critical watershed and the salmon who depend on it. Here, here, here. Good question. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for raising this very important issue. We continue to ensure the sustainability of aquatic ecosystems. We understand the importance of fishery resources in the Cowichan River to the local Indigenous groups and to the local community. We're aware of the issues regarding the low summer, the, the low summer flows and the threats to fish and fish habitat. Uh, the department and the minister have attended uh, meetings with local indigenous groups, provincial and local governments. We're actively engaged in ongoing discussions to find solutions and the possibilities of federal funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh -huh. Member for Yorkton, Melville. Speaker, veteran Medrick Cousineau has exposed another blow to veterans in the Pension for Life scam. Veterans with the same injury applying before and after April 1st are not treated equally. Under the Liberals' new plan, veterans will receive less. Why do the Liberals think that veterans with the same injury should not be compensated equally? Mr. Cousineau's Liberal Member of Parliament even agrees that this is unacceptable and reached out to the Prime Minister. So I'd like to ask him, will the Prime Minister reverse his cuts to veterans, or does he still believe they're simply asking too much? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Speaker, as we have and always will, make sure we take care of our veterans. The well-being and financial security of our veterans is vitally important. I want to be very clear, this policy is in decide to ensure injured veterans are better off than on the pension for life than they would have been under the previous government's policy. Mr. Speaker, veterans will be better off than under the previous government's policy. We want to make sure that we treat our people, our veterans, who deserve, who's uh, to Took care of our democracy and freedom in a proper manner, and we will. Order. The honourable member for Caribou Prince George wishes to offer advice to the Minister of Veterans Affairs. I would, I would encourage him to do that either when he has the floor, or perhaps at some other place and time. 
The Honourable Member for Bhopal-Limalu. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, hand over heart, the Prime Minister, surrounded by candidates, included candidates, including candidates who were veterans, promised that never would veterans have to use a legal fight to have their rights respected. He promised a full pension for life. That's a broken promise. And veterans themselves are saying that. The money is not being provided for that. Why? For Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I appreciate my honourable colleague's concern, but in fact, he is wrong. The Prime Minister indicated quite clearly that the pension for life will be much better, and, the, and what is provided for the veterans will be much better than it was under the previous government. That is what we promised, and I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that is what we will deliver. We have and will continue to make sure our veterans are cared for properly. Member for Barry Innisfil. Well, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister did stand in this House stating he's instructed the Minister of Veterans Affairs to ensure that no veteran will receive less on a go-forward basis. Veterans have themselves proven that the new Liberal Pension for Life Income Retirement Benefit is less than the previous benefits it replaces. Can the, can the Minister confirm to this House and our veterans who are watching right now that the new Income Retirement Benefit will be paid out at the rate of the benefits it replaces as of April 1st, 2019, and when will that happen? Yeah. Well, Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my honourable colleague's question, but to come from a party that slashed veterans' affairs, that slashed a thousand jobs at a case affairs, who slashed the caseworkers so they, they could not even apply. We have hired over 650 case uh, workers. We have up to over 400 uh, uh, case workers to make sure that when people apply, when veterans apply, they will be approved. And in fact, uh, Veterans Affairs is saying yes more often. Not to mention the $10 billion we invested to make sure veterans are served properly. The Honourable Member for Chateau-Guelacolle. President. Mr. Speaker, advancing gender equality and investing in women is essential for growing the middle class, strengthening our economy and building a healthy future in Canada and throughout the world. We can't do this work alone. It requires multiple sectors, industries and communities to bring about change. Can the Minister of Women and Gender Equality please inform the House of the work that is being done by our government to mobilize all stakeholders to achieve gender equality? Excellent. Excellent question. Good. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I thank my Honourable colleague from Chateauguay Lacolle for her advocacy and effective leadership. Here, here. One million jobs. One million families with a safe and affordable roof over their heads. The lowest unemployment on record for four decades. 825,000 Canadians no longer going to bed hungry at night because our plan is working. A plan that sees equality as a driver for economic growth. Women Deliver will offer us an opportunity to work with partners to seize the untold economic benefits that exist for all partners in the global community. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, the evidence is overwhelming. The Liberals will not meet their Paris targets. Still, the Minister continues to mislead Canadians by repeating that, by golly, we're somehow going to meet those targets. Is that why she said last Friday, and I quote, if you repeat it, if you say it louder, if that is your talking point, people will totally believe it. So did I get that right? When will the minister come clean with Canadians and admit that her so-called climate plan is not as advertised? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives' climate plan is exactly as advertised. We just had uh, the Conservative Party announce their climate plan. What did it include? It included making it free to 
to pollute. Uh, in the face of energy companies who said there needs to be a price on pollution, it includes killing our new environmental assessment law that we put forward that would rebuild trust but would also ensure that good projects go ahead in a timely way. The Conservative Party has no plan for the uh, environment, has no plan for climate change, and no plan for the economy. The Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Canada's forest sector is a fundamental part of many rural communities like my riding. It provides high-quality, well-paying jobs that thousands of Canadians rely on to support their families. In British Columbia, we are seeing temporary and permanent mill closures and shift reductions. The impact of the mountain pine beetle and increasing wildfires pose major threats to our forest industry, as does the Liberal government's total failure to get a new deal on softwood lumber. U.S. duties are hurting our communities. Will the Liberals make the removal of U.S. duties on softwood lumber a real priority and secure a fair deal for Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Natural Resources. Madam President, uh, we are taking action to ensure our forestry sector remains a source of good middle-class jobs across the country and is prepared to, complete, to compete globally. The programs, loans and loan guarantees made available through $867 million of softwood lumber action plan are actively supporting workers and communities. This past fall, we also announced $100 million through the Strategic Innovation Fund for Forestry. And building on our work to date, Budget 2019 includes an additional investment of over $250 million, which will help the sector to innovate, diversify, and grow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Richmond Hill. Madam Speaker, the construction industry is a critical part of the Canadian economy and a source of good middle-class jobs for many Canadians. Contractors and subcontractors need prompt payments for clients in order to sustain their operation and support the significant costs involving construction <laughs> projects. Could the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Public Services and Procurement please update this House on the work our government will be doing to ensure that the contractors and subcontractors in the construction industry are paid in a timely manner on federal projects? Good, good question. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Procurement. Speaker, we okay. have very good news. Here, here, Unlike here. the Harper Conservatives, we've listened to contractors on the need for federal prop payment legislation. We know that these businesses provide good middle-class jobs to many Canadians from coast to coast to coast and deserve to be paid promptly. And as announced in Budget 2019, we also will put forward legislation that ensure payments reach construction suppliers and their employees quickly and efficiently. We're standing up for workers. We're standing up for contractors. I just want to remind members when somebody has the floor that that person should have a peace and quiet in the house so that everybody can hear what he's saying. The Honourable Member order. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Madam Speaker, Manitobans deserve the right to sell their resources abroad. Minnesota is willing to buy the clean hydroelectric power that Manitoba proudly produces. The National Energy Board has approved the transmission lines, but the Prime Minister is overruling the decision and is trying to stop the project. It's clear the Prime Minister is holding a grudge against Manitoba because they won't go along with his carbon tax. Why won't the Prime Minister let Manitoba sell its clean energy? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Natural Resources. Canadians understand that for good projects to move ahead and grow our economy, we must protect our environment and respect the rights of Indigenous peoples. Our government has been hard at work consulting with Indigenous communities on the Manitoba-Minnesota Transmission Project in order to fulfil our duty to meaningfully consult. Our focus remains on getting it right. Our government has extended the timeline for a decision on this project until June 14, 2019. We have issued the short extension to ensure the Crown has sufficient time to fulfil its legal duty to consult and come to the right decision. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes, Verchères. Madam Speaker, commercial shipping causes wakes that are eating away at the St. Lawrence shoreline. They're losing about two metres per year between Montreal and Lac-Saint-Pierre. We're still. It has been 20 years since Ottawa 
abolished the shoreline protection program and riverside communities are having to undertake the restorative work themselves. The government has completely abandoned citizens who are dealing with the consequences of this. Will the government finally take responsibility and invest or are citizens going to have to go to court? The Honourable Minister of Transport, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And of course, we empathize and sympathize with all those who are dealing with flooding. We know that water levels are very high. And we know that the levels on the Great Lakes have been much higher this year, and that has an impact on the St. Lawrence. And that's why the government has set speed limits to reduce the number of waves and the wake in the area of Lac Saint-Pierre. We're very aware of the importance of setting the, these, re, these restrictions, and we'll continue to monitor the situation. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Pertriottes, Verchères. Mr. Speaker, I'm not talking about flooding. I'm talking about erosion the whole year long. Mr. Speaker, it's not just happening in our neck of the woods. Climate change is also causing ravages. In Ile de la Madeleine, they're losing 0.5 metres a year of their shoreline. And almost every year, the Gaspésie and the Côte Nord are cut off from the rest of the world because erosion is washing away the 132 and the 138. Rather than sink billions of dollars for, in, out of Quebecers' pockets into dirty oil, will the government take responsibility and help its citizens? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Madam Speaker, yes, there is shoreline erosion in the Gaspésie and the Magdalen Islands that is due to climate change, is due to the warming of the oceans. And I can tell you that our government is acting ambitiously to tackle warming of the oceans and climate warming. Thank you. For Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've been debating in this place a climate emergency. We know we're in a climate emergency. It's not in the abstract. It's real and happening in real time. For the community of Pic and Jacum, First Nation in Northern Ontario right now, 4,000 people are less than one to two kilometres from a raging fire. Recent reports are that the Hercules aircraft can't land because of the smoke. It's terrifying for them right now. Can the Honourable Minister of Public Security and Emergency Preparedness give us an update on what the government is doing to help? Honourable Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. The situation at Pekanjikum uh, was raised with the Government of Canada earlier this morning through a formal request for assistance from the province of Ontario. The request was for Canadian Forces assets, namely aircraft and Rangers personnel, to help evacuate people from Pekanjikum. The answer was, of course, yes. The assistance is being mobilized. Smoke and other local conditions are not helping with air operations. But we understand the deep angst in the community and all levels of government will work strongly together to keep people in that community safe. And that brings us to the end of question period.